Hello everybody. Here we continue the NPT and lessons on the English Romantic writers 1798 to 1832. Our focus for the next few sessions is on empire and orientalism. We will begin with an introduction to romanticism, the empire and the racial cultural other. The exotic east, the seductive howry like eastern Arab woman, the corrupt influence of the east, the cruel Muslim tyrannical ruler, the deceptive, deceiving Indian. These are the stereotypes that have populated English romantic literature for a very long time. There are instances of what is called romantic orientalism. But stereotypes apart, these are also bits of evidence, literary evidence of the period's general curiosity about and interest in other cultures. And when we look at the text from this period, roughly 1750 to about 1850, you will see texts about China, the Far East, India, the Arab world, Constantinople, Istanbul and others, um, which have entered the English literary canon. This interest and curiosity about the other nations was fueled by translations of texts from Indian and Oriental languages. Um, William Joseph's translation, so for example, the translation of the Arabian Nights, the Bhagavad Gita and others. But there was also a lot of news coverage of events in the East which appeared in the English papers. So for instance, the Anglo-Mysore War, specifically with Tipu Sultan and Hyder Ali, um, commonly appeared in the Times, the London Times and other periodicals. Um, traveler accounts also fed back into the English social imagination, commodated of, of course from the 17th century tea, um, cocoa, uh, which entered via mercantilism into the English household. So in short, what you need to understand is the literary interest in the East, in the non-European other Asian and other places was also supplemented by the arrival of commodities from carpets to tea. Uh, also people, as in people of different races who entered the English and European imagination. Um, they also put together very learned societies such as the Asiatic Society of Calcutta founded in 1784 and there was a serial publication of volumes such as the Asiatic Researchers which compiled information about um, the poetry of the East, the religion of the East, the architecture of the East and so on and so forth. So there is a very large cultural apparatus of knowledge making about the East that fuels the romantic interest in the East. Um, and if you notice the empire's rise in the last decades of the 18th century is more or less coterminous with the rise of the romantic movement. Two quick summaries of the period's linkage with, the, with India slash empire. And like I said, it's not just India, but several parts of the East, including Arabia, were part of the social imagination and the literary canon during this period. But our focus is more or less just India and South Asia. Our two comments on the link between India slash empire and the English thinking on, or, um, of the globe itself. The first is by Sari Macdissey, who writes, even if the empire was not the only area of concern, it was certainly something of an obsession throughout the Romantic period. With a notable exception of William Blake, every single major writer in the period, and some minor ones as well, had at least a passing flirtation with imperialism or its major cultural manifestation. He gives a long list of authors who had very strong interests in um, the East. And he mentions uh, Jane Austen, Walter Scott, Tom Moore, Walter Savage Landau, Percy Shelley, Elizabeth Hamilton and others. And he makes the argument that several of them had significant imperialist and orientalist works, they also had careers in the East. The second one is a uh, very learned resource, of course, uh, from W. W. Norton uh, and company, uh, available on their website. And it's a contextual uh, citation that I have put up here for you on the slide. Romantic Orientalism is a recurrence of recognizable elements of Asian and African place names, historical and legendary people, religions, philosophies, art, architecture, interior decoration, costume, and the like in the writings of the British Romantics. So that's the context, that's a large span of what the Romantic Orientalist tendency is. 
Uh, please understand what we're talking about is the arrival of the East in the, ima in the social imagination of the English and the Europeans. It occurs in the form of commodities, uh, people, and literary themes. So there are three components to this. Uh, the commodities like like I mentioned, coffee and tea, which have come in from various parts of the world. Also, uh, China pottery, uh, and you, some of you might recall Charles Lamb's famous essay, Old China. It occurs in the form of people who move from India and other parts of the world and travel through Britain. Uh, William Hazlitt's famous essay, Indian Jugglers, would be a great study of this. There are also other products, such as opium, which enters the English imagination. And many of you know Coleridge's interest in the substance. Thomas De Quincey's uh, Extraordinarily long, uh, extraordinary uh, exploration in the form of the Confessions of an English Opium Eater, all of which are part of the Romantic Orientalist project. We shall restrict ourselves to select themes here uh, in the representations of the empire. First and foremost, to many of the English, the Orient represented an erotic geography, what Felicity Nussbaum famously called torrid zones or pornotropics, referring to European representations of the climatic conditions the supposedly hypersexual nature of the natives and the extraordinary uh, fertility of its women. This erotic geography was often embodied in numerous sketches of the oriental woman, the seraglio, the harem, um, the, the mysterious woman of the harem. Oriental excess revolves around women. For example, coming up on your slide now, is William Beckford's description of Karathis, Vathek's mother, in his 1786 oriental tale, Gothic tale, Vathek. Here is Ka Karathis described for you on the slide up next. By secret stairs, known only to herself and her son, she first repaired to the mysterious recesses in which were deposited the mummies that had been brought from the catacombs of the ancient pharaohs. Of these, she ordered several to be taken, and as you go down that paragraph, you'll see what she has gathered. The blind of the right eye were preserved, the oil of the most venomous serpents, rhinoceros horns. It's an entire collection, actually, of things that have come from various parts of the world. So there is that. Now here is Byron's Don Juan, Canto 4, where an Arab woman is described as follows. Large, dark eye showed a deep passion's force, though sleeping like a lion near a source. So there is the passionate woman. There is the evil woman. The Easterner in these kinds of stereotypical uh, accounts, the Eastern is full of secrecy and guile, like Karathis, but is also therefore a strong temptation. The seductive East is a major trope in the literature of this period. And both Western masculinity and femininity are at risk from this seductive Arab slash Moor slash Indian. In Zofloya, for example, Charlotte Decker's novel, the Moor seduces over a period of time the European Victoria. Here is an example of the theme of the pornotropic coming up on your slide now. This is Charlotte Decker's novel about a European woman, Victoria, seduced by a Moor. Zofloya is the Moor. Here it is. Never till this moment had she been so near the person of the Moor. Such powerful fascination dwelt around him that she felt incapable of withdrawing from his arms, yet ashamed. Note that. She's ashamed, but she's unable to control herself. Basically, what Dakar is suggesting is this overwhelming sensuality of the native Arab Muslim, uh, the martial races, and the white woman mesmerized by it. The eroticized other that we see in Beckford, Dakar, and other texts represents a certain envy and anxiety over what the Westerners saw as a feminine or feminized civilization with touches of the magical and the mysterious. See, for example, Felicia Heyman's representation here coming up on your slide now, um, an excerpt of three lines from Heyman's one of more famous poems, England and Spain. It's fairy palaces and enchanted bowers. They're all Arabian fiction I could tell of potent genii or a wizard spell. You might actually say that these three lines encompass everything you need to know about Romantic Orientalism. There is magic, there's Arabia, there's a sense of the mystical and the mysterious fairy play, uh, palace and enchanted bowers. Then there are wizards as well. So there is the seductive East, the seductive Arab um, woman or harem. 
there's a converse. In other instances, the Arab ha harem is a prison for the woman. And there is this politics of pity that plays out in the Romantic Orientalists, which shows that women are treated badly by Muslim rulers, and we need to, as in we here would be the white man, having to rescue them. This kind of treatment of women, according to them, is sanctioned by Islam in texts such as Byron's famous poem, The Jiar. This is a trope that shows the Arab world as always anti-woman, as sexist and patriarchal. It gives the romantic poet author to create the stereotype of the vulnerable woman who has to be rescued. Coming up on your slide is a set of three lines from Byron's The Jiar. And I've quoted this before on an earlier occasion as part of the politics of representation in the romantic writers. His creed which said that woman is but dust, a soulless toy for tyrant's lust. So there is a set activist, and now here's a vulnerable, where the woman has to be rescued. She is trapped in the prison of her home. In Moore's Lala Rukh, Hafid courts the emir's daughter Hinda by climbing into her tower, and her home is depicted almost like a prison. Here is a description from Lala Rukh. So Hinda, have thy face and mind like holy mysteries, lynch enshrined, and oh, what transport for a lover to lift the veil that shades them o'er. The woman who's pardanashin, who's closed, but also segregated, separated, is treated badly, and that in itself renders her vulnerable. Another standard model for the representation of the Oriental woman, especially the Indian one, was that of the vulnerable, oppressed, and exploited, but chaste, religious, and devoted woman. William Hodges, um, official painter uh, appointed by Warren Hastings to travel through India and put together his account of it with images and writing. He publishes Travels in India, 1793 to 1798, as part of this project. Um, William Hodges' visual representation of the widows of India portrayed them as docile, heads bowed, and vulnerable. There are at least two or three images, paintings that Hodges did, which show widows, um, Indian women going to pray, and they are all docile, their heads are bent, um, the parda is like this. Uh, they look very meek and um, vulnerable. So the Oriental woman then becomes this vulnerable, sensitive person who requires taking care of. But the pornotropic in addition, pornotropic in addition to all this is also a space of deep emotions, especially among the women. Here is Byron's Gulbayez in Don Juan and Sidney Owens is the missionary. Two quotes up there, one after the other on your slides. She's tempestuous. She's described as a vulgar tempest. and um, But there is also uh, a, an example of uh, or a trope of ocean which warring against a rocky isle and the deep passions in them. So the woman is always exceedingly passionate. Um, passionate is used partially in a pejorative sense but also as something you envy. So like I said at the beginning, it's, it's an over fertile, over sexed native. Here's Sidney Owens, the missionary, on your next slide. When he beheld her receiving the homage of a deity, all lovely as she was, she awakened no other sentiment in his breast than a pious indignation. Natural to his religious zeal at beholding human reason so subdued by human imposition. So this whole idea that the Indian woman, the Arab woman is subdued because the social order, especially religion, is oppressive, is central to how you see the East itself in the Romantic period. Paralleling this, would be poems like Wordsworth's The Complaint of a Forsaken Indian Woman, which spoke of the vulnerable Indian. In this case, the Indian is um, the Native American woman. She's again abandoned to die while her tribe marches onward. If you look at Robert Sadi's Dirge of the American Widow, its protagonist is a Native Indian woman, that is Native American woman, who seeks the vengeance of anguish, as he puts it. And you'll see variants of this in Feli Shehman's The Indian City and other uh, writers. Having looked at the portrayal of women, we now move on quickly to looking at masculinities. Three principal modes of dealing with other masculinities may be traced in the English literature of the period. In one mode, we see the exaggerated European masculinity in the adventure fiction of Haggard, Ballantyne, and Kipling, where it's all gung-ho, heroism, adventure. They are all committed people, young boys and, and young men. And um, if you look at Ballantyne, the fur traders, and the other texts, it's all about adventurous young men. Their masculinities are of a particular machismo kind. That's for type one. Type two, the racial cultural other male is reduced to an effeminate, emasculated creature. 
William Beckford's Gulshan Rao's is an example here, where the effeminate Indian requires as much protection as the woman herself in the way the British represented it. A third mode is of English masculinity itself rendered vulnerable in this colonial context. That is, um, the white man is itself, is himself under threat from the context of the Orient. And Byron's Giaour in the poem of the same title revolves around an assertion of masculine ego. So you cannot let it go. You, you have to make sure that you uh, have to fight this and establish your masculinity. Hassan kills Layla for, his, for her infidelity. And then the Venetian Giaour, who was Layla's lover, hunts down the Muslim Hassan. The Jewish masculinity is a vaguely troubled one. And here's a description of that uh, troubled masculinity for you. So there is the uh, English representation of the effeminate nature of the Oriental man studied famously by Revati Krishna Swami in effeminism. So they would construct, say, the Bengali Munshi as effeminate as a way of saying they need us. Um, and there's a longish description of Gulchan Rao's in the text as well for you to take a look at. Um, what you can understand from all this is there are specific stereotypes of men and women that you see laid out in the romantic era. That's not innocent description. It constructs the East in a certain way. More importantly, by positing the natives women as delicate, vulnerable, needing protection, the British were able to say it's justified what we are doing there because we are their protectors. And some of you may know that this trope of rescuing the brown woman or the Asian woman is repeated into the 20th century as well. For instance, when the uh, war on terror was declared, uh, Cherry Blair, then the, the wife of the then um, Prime Minister of England, Tony Blair, said, um, what about the poor Afghani women? We must do something for them because look at the way the Taliban is treating them. So the trope of the vulnerable Asian woman, the non-European woman, has continued for a very long time. It is a part of the social imaginary of the English itself. Thank you.